Let's take your guys' questions. Uh, the first question I want to answer, I said, is about an apartment dweller. Uh, Joelle Brook. Hi, Joelle. Joelle says, what ways are there that can help at-home shops be renter-friendly? This is a really important question. Uh, she goes on to say, <laughs> specifically, living in apartments with hard nopes, such as nailing holes in the walls, the floors can't sustain any damage, like spill stains, and the carpet cannot be removed or changed. Uh, she says, the only solution I can think of is placing dry core panels on top of carpet, but I'm not her sure how sustainable it is covering carpet for extended periods of time. Um, I'm going to tackle this in a couple of different uh, trajectories, but I think your last assertion is absolutely correct. I think if you live in a... Let us start with the whole idea about renting, right? So you rent an apartment, let's say you're, you know, you don't just pay the whatever your rent is. Let's say it's a thousand bucks a month. Uh, you don't just pay that rent. You also pay a security deposit. And I, I, I got to tell you, in my experience, it is rarely simple getting your security deposit back. Presumably within the world, it should be that you clean your apartment, you take pictures of your apartment before you inhabit it all the different stains that are on the floors and the bumps that are in the walls, and then you live there for a while. And then when you move out, you clean it, take a picture of the same apartment. It should look roughly the same, except for a little more living. Um, and then when it is you know, roughly the condition you rented it in, you get your security deposit back. In my personal experience, it is never simple to get your security deposit back. The landlord's always looking for stuff. And frankly, you know, people are wear and tear on apartments. So when you add a makerspace into the mix, it is really something to pay careful attention to because one spill of some acrylic paint could cause you to have to pay for the carpeting across your apartment uh, or, you know, that whole room. That's real. And I don't think, per your last assertion, Joelle, uh, that you are not sure how sustainable it is to cover carpet for extended periods of time. I agree. I don't think it's entirely sustainable to do that. Um, if you were going to cover carpet for an, a period of time, I would cover it with something that was absorbed. I would cover it with a waterproof layer and then I would put something, probably two waterproof layers. And then I would put something absorbent over that and another waterproof layer on top of that before I'd cover it with something. Cause the last thing you want is to put down a surface, not think about that. And then that surface becomes this like seeding ground for staining your carpet or whatever floor you have underneath. Hold on. My internet has also been a little spotty. I know there's outages all across the country right now. All across the country or just California? Yeah, it's, it's big. Okay. Let's talk about making in an apartment. Um, when you're doing stuff like this, that's pretty sustainable, not going to cause a lot of havoc. Um, but yeah, when you start to use paints or sprays, um, you've got to be really careful in an apartment. Um, you may even think about a, uh, a, a, a work surface that itself is bordered so that a spill would be contained within the work surface. Uh, in my fantasy, I have at some point a TV show in which I go around and help people set up tiny little shops in their houses. Like, I love this idea as, as a show. It's, a, it's, it's like not a home makeover show. It's like a mini shop building show. And it's just, you know, I've built shops in tiny spaces and in large spaces and they all have their different requirements and they're all, they all have their limitations and the things that are great about them. Um, and every situation is unique. Everything you want to build, um, you know, brings with it its commensurate set of issues. But I think, it's really smart for young makers or people who don't have a lot of experience in the world to realize that the uh, it's not just as simple when you rent an apartment of putting a security deposit, keeping the apartment nice, and then getting it back when you're done. Uh, if you are making in there, you are potentially increasing your liability significantly. And a, a lot of landlords that I've run into could take a situation like that and make a lot of hay out of it at your expense. Uh, I'm not trashing landlords as an overall group. I'm just saying in my experience, I've run into some unscrupulous renters uh, in the past. And I've also run into some wonderful and scrupulous ones. Um, Laura Kampf has a beautiful, actually the very first video I became aware of Laura Kampf 
that, that helped me become aware of Laura Kampf is a video in which she made a portable woodworker's bench that she could use and then remove when she didn't need it. Uh, I think the idea of portable solutions for things like that is really, really smart. Um, I think if I were, well, actually, I'll give you a wonderful example of a tiny workspace. And I wonder if I could find any pictures of this. So when Lucas went into production on episodes one, two, and three, Star Wars, he they set up a tiny little model shop up at the ranch on the third floor of the main house, uh, which is a, 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 an office space. It was never meant to be a shop space. But um, my friends, John Goodson and John Duncan spent years up in that third floor office, effectively making all the prototype maquettes for all the models for episodes one, two, and I'm assuming three, although I was gone by then. Um, and they like, they covered all the surfaces with plastic. They put down, uh, they put down protective flooring to protect, but they were painting maquettes. They were airbrushing. They had little, uh, air retrieval stations on there. I don't know if I'm telling too many tales out of school, but it's been long enough. I don't think anyone's going to get in trouble. Um, but yeah, they had little like evacuation fans so they could airbrush the models, but not, you know, get it airborne out in the, uh, out in the space. Um, it was a wonderful, it was like the ultimate apartment model shop because this space was never meant to have that kind of industry in it. I spent a few weeks up there. I made one of the, I think I made the first, uh, Mark Siegel and I made the first foam core mock-up of the arena from episode, episode two is the arena, right? The big arena battle? Yeah. Um, Joel, I could talk about this for a long time and I recognize I haven't come to any specific conclusions, but I, I, because I don't have any, every situation is unique. It's more about having a frame of mind for thinking through those solutions. Um, but you really, like if you're working with wet stuff, whether it's chemicals or specifically paints, you've got to be incredibly, incredibly careful in a space that's not yours, that you don't own. Because like I said, one bottle of lacquer could cost you thousands of dollars if it spills in the wrong place. That is a great question. And frankly, um, this video goes to air on YouTube later and you're watching it and you have some solutions. I would love to see your, uh, your suggestions in the comments. Um, this is, it's a group effort. Uh, so we got some questions live during my build. Uh, somebody says, um, Matt wants to know, shop lighting question. Is there a good practice for spacing out shop lights across a ceiling? Um, no, except more is better. Um, I, as I said in the beginning of this live stream, I'm toying around with the idea of expanding my shop space within the space that I inhabit here. And one of the key things that I would that I would tackle in that case is the lighting. Because uh, when I built these guys, when I built these, it was when I discovered that I had not been working with enough light my whole life. Um, and having a bright light source to work with is, it's, for me, it was, I was shocked at how much I had overlooked that specific bit of infrastructure. So if I was moving in here today from, from, from scratch, one of the key things I would do is I'd probably build a, a, a long rectangular truss and I'd hang a whole bunch of LED light fixtures from it. Uh, I'd get a bathed wash of light across the whole shop that would probably be, you know, another full f-stop brighter than it is now. Uh, in addition to having lights at each of the tool stations, uh, including a overhead light at each tool station and small detail lights. The small detail light I have on my bandsaw gets a tremendous amount of use, as do the ones on my drill press and my mill. Um, The rule of thumb that I would say is more is better. It is a great time to want to light your shop because these like 48 inch fixtures are like 20 bucks, 25 bucks at the hardware store. These are 48 inch LED fixtures. Now I just had my first LED fixture fail on me, which is really annoying because the bulbs are rated till whatever, 100,000 hours, but the electronics <laughs> don't last a fraction of that. Uh, so I'm, you know, I might do your research just to make sure you're finding the durable brands that, uh, that will last you, but 
I don't think you can go too far overboard now. You can load up your ceiling with LED lights. It's not going to get too warm. It's just about making sure that you can see. Um, and like I said, it is an often overlooked, even by me, uh, part of shop infrastructure. Great question, Matt.